This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce our two colleagues from Paris. Um, and the first one to speak will be my co-editor, co uh, Professor Jeremy Pauli, who's based at the University of Versailles Saint Quentin. I always call it Saint Quentin. Saint Quentin. Sorry, <laughs> Versailles. Uh, who's vice dean of the United <laughs> Faculty at the Institute of, of uh, Cultural and International Studies. Uh, she's edited the Penguin edition of Nostromo, and she's written numerous articles on Conrad. Uh, she'll be followed by um, Mark Fitzpatrick, uh, who's just come in from Paris, uh, who's just submitted his PhD at the Sorbonne on Conrad, Conrad's adventure fiction in the period 80, 90, 1895 through to the French reception of Conrad and Stevenson's adventure fiction. Yeah. Right. So I do it to that. I'm to hear what they have to say. And also adaptations uh, in like uh, and different media. media. Um, so um, very quickly, and then I'll, I'll turn to the 1930s because in fact my uh, um, subject for the volume of the, uh, the French reception from the 1930s to the present day. Uh, and um, since we only have 20 minutes, um, I, I'm going to focus on. Michel Lévy's uh, Fashion Africa, uh, and I've got a handout here if you want to uh, pass this. Um, only 10 copies, unfortunately. I don't think people can read French because of. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, very quickly, um, the, uh, 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 I'm not going to cover the, uh, the early reception because I think that Mark is going to do this. I uh, uh, just wanted to, uh, to remind you that in, in, uh, in uh, 1982, uh, Gallimard uh, uh, published uh, Conrad in the very prestigious uh, Gallimard Iliad, the Bible uh, uh, um, collection, which uh, um, uh, confirmed that Conrad uh, had uh, um, uh, the, the, the worldwide status, I mean, the status of a, as a world uh, writer. Um, the, uh, the difficult thing um, uh, for the uh, general editor, Sylvain Moudou, uh, who is the heart and soul of the whole project, was whether to, uh, to republish uh, and revise uh, original editions or publish new uh, tra translations. I'm sorry. Uh, so new translations were published. Uh, the, uh, and the, 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 the famous exception is, of course, Sheen's translation of Typhoon. Uh, and the, uh, the funny thing is that I've checked uh, when uh, Typhoon was actually uh, being published, I mean retranslated, and it came very late. Uh, and uh, the, the, the first uh, translation was uh, done by a certain Odette Lamolle. Uh, Odette Lamolle, he's, he was quite a, uh, um, I mean, this is an interesting case because in fact she was not a professional uh, translator, she was not a university professor, she was just a, a woman uh, 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 who had a uh, who was born in 1910, uh, then she, she uh, got a PhD from the University of Bordeaux, and then she had a professional life, she married, she became a cattle breeder, and then when she retired, uh, she started to translate uh, Conrad, and she published nine, 19 translations of Conrad uh, in this Autrement uh, edition. Um, and then, uh, well, and then uh, Marc Poré uh, uh, then uh, retranslated. Okay, so uh, since I, I, I promised to be very quick, I just wanted to give you an idea of the type of um, adaptations that you can get, and honestly, it's uh, turned into a sort of full-time job to sort of try and track uh, everything that's going on uh, around combat uh, these days. So uh, you've got, for instance, graphic novels, uh, such as this one, uh, this one, which is a um, um, graphic novel with three parts, uh, one, um, I mean, um, based on uh, an outpost of programs, but also connecting with Albert uh, and I think uh, there's work to be done 
than this. Um, <clears throat> this one is entitled Le Ténébreux Voyage de Joseph Theodor Konar Kozelowski. Uh, this is a biography uh, in graphic novel. Um, this one, which uh, I discovered two days ago, uh, de goût d'après, uh, from uh, an adaptation from, adapted from the Nigger of the Narcissus. We've got movie uh, adaptations as well. Uh, Patrice Chéreau, uh, Gabriel, uh, adapti uh, adapting The Return. Um, <coughs> um, Henri Smalley uh, by uh, Chantal Ackerman, who died just uh, a month ago. Um, and and Conrad is out, I mean, he's present in the press. Uh, is, he was present uh, two years ago, for instance, um, in Le Monde, the uh, uh, evening paper, uh, in which they, they run a series in, on, on writers in the Far East, and, and Conrad was one of those uh, um, writers. And two days ago, I discovered a, this, this radio program, program Radio France, uh, which is a reading of Heart of Darkness, not exactly a reading, an adaptation of the text uh, with uh, original music and um, a score uh, composed just for the uh, uh, event. Um, the uh, LAM uh, volume, which has just come out, uh, in which, uh, in, in particular, um, uh, there are just a few of the uh, Numerous contemporary writers who claimed that they were influenced by Conrad. Uh, um, books uh, about and this one in particular is very good. Uh, uh, Olivier Weber. Olivier Weber is a, is a travel writer, war correspondent, journalist, diplomat, former diplomat. Um, um, and this is a very uh, perceptive book, I think. Um, right, so that gives you an idea of uh, the uh, continuing presence of, uh, of uh, just Conrad in France, and, and honestly, it's uh, really a, a full-time job to concentrate uh, to <laughs> on this. Um, so, um, I wanted to focus on, on uh, Michel Lévis's Phantom Africa, which uh, uh, again has never been translated into, uh, into English. Um, but first of all, I need to um, start with the general context of the 1930s in France. Uh, you reminded us, Robert, that uh, in the 1930s in Britain uh, there was a kind of neglect. Uh, I think this is the moment when uh, um, things started to crystallize around the, uh, uh, the figure of Conrad uh, in France. So Mark would agree uh, with me on this. But uh, in the 1930s, uh, when much of the political debate in France focused on French colonies, uh, two related trends developed. On the one hand, uh, there was a spate of colonial novels. Uh, uh, they remember that read that uh, some 13 novels were published in just uh, five years, uh, both in favor and critical of the uh, colonial uh, enterprise. And on the other hand, uh, the promotion of reportage uh, and of the figure of the grand reporter, the reporter, halfway between a journalist and a man of letters. That is a literary dimension, the use of literary stylistic devices, style, where what was expected of the reporter, whose literary, uh, whose function was a quote, to fuse Anglo Saxon style of journalism based on facts only, and a French style of literary uh, journalism, which did not neglect style and intertextuality. Now, for instance, the series of articles uh, written by Albert Pouha, uh, by Albert Londres, Terre des Bains, for instance, uh, published in 1929, and Joseph Kessel, The Slave Market, uh, published in 1933, um, in which, incidentally, he expressed his admiration for Conrad, and in, in, in particular, uh, uh, youth, his admiration of youth, to mention just the most illustrious uh, uh, of them. These series of articles were published in book form, uh, which further blurred the frontier between journalism uh, and literature. Now, in this context, uh, Heart of Darkness became the central text, and Conrad himself became a reference uh, for all the would be travelers and journalists. Now, um, many uh, people <coughs> have analyzed already the apparent influence of Heart of Darkness on both Andre Malraux's The Roll Away and Céline's uh, Journey to the End of the Night, so I'm not going to. Uh, um, um, come back to this, but to, to cut a long story short, I would only uh, say that I tend to agree with um, um, uh, people like Luc Hasson, for instance, who wrote that the analogies between, for instance, Heart of Darkness and the uh, and Journey to the End of the Night uh, should not necessarily point to Conrad's direct influence, uh, and that one must take into account the role played by the European discourse on, on Africa. And this is why I wanted to uh, focus on, on Michel Lévy's Phantom Africa, 
which undoubtedly struck a dis discordant note when it was first published by Gallimard in 1934, that is, just a few months after the return of the Dakar Djibouti ethnographic and linguistic mission it was supposed to report on. <coughs> the end result was indeed very different from the strict task that Lévis had been assigned, uh, that is, to keep a record of the uh, mission's daily activities. Now, in his own words, the book uh, turned to be half documentary, half poetic, and goes well beyond the initial purpose that it was supposed to serve. The interesting thing for us is that Lévis, uh, in Phantom Africa, and especially in the chapter, uh, in the entry that have um, uh, isolated, refers to Conrad not so much to express his admiration for him, that is, in literary asides, uh, as many other uh, writers do, for instance, Kessel in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the slave markets, uh, but to examine his own frame of mind at different periods of his life, and including the uh, ethnographic mission itself. Now, the text of Phantom Africa is now inseparable from the prophecies and notes that uh, Lévis later added. The first one, uh, the, the first preface was written in 1950, when the book was republished after being forbidden and all copies uh, destroyed uh, during the war. The second um, uh, introduction or preface was written in 1981. Now, in the 1950 preface, uh, uh, Lévis uses a comparison with the character of Lord Jim uh, to quantify the transformation that the uh, experience operated on. Uh, this is my, uh, perhaps, lame translation of the passage which you have in the, uh, in the handout. This is the, uh, I gave you the, um, the 1950 uh, uh, introduction uh, for you to read. So he said that um, the, the uh, <coughs> uh, thanks to this experience, he uh, uh, seizing, he says, seizing to aspire to the, the romantic role of the white man who, in a generous sleep, like Norton, pledging his life on his fidelity to the late chief, steps down from the pedestal the, justice, the prejudice of the hierarchy of the races that created for him to bond with men situated on the other side of the fence. Now, Jim is referred to uh, elsewhere, uh, also to qualify the mythological idea of Africa, as he said in a 1948 conference entitled The Message of Africa, that was his conception of Africa uh, before he actually went there. When he launched into the experience, Lévis had just broken away from the, cir from, from the circle of the uh, surrealists and was generally disaffected, depressed. He'd started uh, psychoanalysis and saw in this trip to Africa an opportunity to get out of himself by immersing himself into, I quote, a primitive mentality I felt nostalgia for. What he discovered in Africa, however, was, was his own inability to get out of himself, his self-centeredness, which is all expressed in the title he gave to the book, Phantom Africa. In the end, the text tells us he himself was the phantom uh, in all this, I quote, adopting the self-important attitude of the cultured uh, uh, Occidental, even in, his, in the denigration of his own civilization, viewing everything with the eye of the athlete and almost constantly brooding over his own deficiencies. Now, in the, 19, uh, in the same 1950 uh, preface, Lenis mentions that in Africa, to compensate for what he saw as, a uh, sort of late translation again, a wimp's nervousness, nervosité de famlette, he sometimes had mood swings uh, in which he identified, I quote, in the blink of an eye with the brutal colonial uh, uh, he had never been, but from whom a certain Conradian taste for the, uh, for the map caps of the confines could, in brief flushes, give a desire to borrow certain gestures. Right. So one of the life was if you need to zoom in on the uh, um, uh, entry that you have in the, uh, in the uh, uh, preface, um, that's uh, December 26th. Uh, 1932. Now, one of the motifs of the book is Lévis' questioning of his own chastity in the course of uh, the trip, of his potency. Uh, this takes an interesting turn towards the end of the book, when Lévis, uh, increasingly bored with the whole expedition, projects to write a quote, a tale, the elements of which would be borrowed to a large extent from his current reality, with an Axel Hayes type of character. Uh, Lévis then delineates the plot, comment commenting upon the similitudes and uh, differences with Conrad's character. 
Now, the context of Yavis' tale is, I quote, an ordinary colony in which haste has an ordinary job. What he borrows uh, in, the, uh, in this entry is the name of the character. The character uh, is called Axel Haste. Uh, he borrows the, the apparent aloofness from human affairs and his ability at times to be obliging. Uh, a reputation for being a homosexual. A privileged connection in Lady Sister, uh, the, the role played by Captain uh, Davidson uh, is played by a doctor who remains unnamed <coughs> and with whom he discusses, I quote, natural science and ethnography. Um, this is not a close relationship uh, and with him Heist uh, never discusses sexuality or psychoanalysis. I'm sort of more or less translating from uh, this uh, entry that you have here. So one day a rumor starts to, pre to spread how much time do I have? Uh, do I need to rush through this? Or? Uh, four okay, good. Um, okay, so I hope you, you uh, uh, understand French and you can read this um, on your own. Uh, <coughs> he, uh, uh, he borrows is uh, both the character uh, uh, of Karma's of, uh, of, um, uh, victory. He also borrows some of uh, uh, Karma's techniques, that is, the use of um, you know, batch, of uh, batch of documents. Uh, the uh, reference to a European fiancé, so and so forth. So, in fact, he's not only borrowing from victory, he's also borrowing from Heart of Darkness, but also from uh, uh, Long Jin. Now, uh, the, since I need to rush to my conclusions on this, um, um, the, the interesting thing, it seems to me, is that in this African context, uh, which was his when this was written, um, the, 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 one can be surprised that uh, uh, Nelly should not have chosen Hajj of Darkness as his main uh, source of inspiration. That's, that's the main thing, it seems to me. Uh, the first obvious reason for this, it would appear, uh, and to use Conrad, is that the meaning of the episode is not outside, uh, but inside, uh, in a comment upon, uh, upon what he saw uh, as his own inadequacy and impotence. Hence, I think, the transformation of Davidson into a doctor. Um, uh, in a footnote uh, to the next entry, uh, written for the 1934 edition, Lewis, uh, rereading this, I quote in, in Cold Blood, explained away this dread of impotence and concludes that everything got warped uh, by his use of fiction and his use of the character of Axel Max. But I would like to suggest another reading of this. Uh, it seems to me that. Um, one may also read Lewis's fear of impotence metaphorically as a direct response to his feeling of inadequacy in the colonial situation, which rests, after all, on the principles of the colonizer's potency, might, and right of possession. The theme of possession runs through the text, I mean, the whole uh, book, and covers various aspects of the colonial situation. First of all, of course, the possession of colonies and uh, the possession of colonial peoples including the possession of the body of the black woman, a fantasy uh, all of uh, uh, Lyris' colleagues succumb to. Uh, the appropriation, of course, or pure and simple theft of objects uh, to which, not without qualms of conscience, uh, Lenis becomes an accomplice, uh, in particular in the famous case of the theft of the Kono. A, co a corollary uh, of this is the scientific excuse which is used and against which uh, Lewis is uh, also very vocal in, in Phantom Africa to justify the appropriation of objects. Uh, that is the collection of objects <coughs> for the newly founded uh, Musée d'Ethnographie du Trocadéro aiming at uh, supposedly a better understanding of African people. But in the summary, instructions to ethnographers uh, which Lewis was ordered to write prior to the expedition itself um, made the use to which uh, uh, a better understanding of African peoples uh, was going to be put, that is, knowledge is might and possession, and all the knowledge gathered during the expedition was going to be useful to colonial administrators and officials for them to improve on the general management of the colonies. Now, uh, in, in Phantom Africa as well, uh, uh, there's uh, um, much uh, on rituals of possession by the Tsar, uh, which Lewis uh, studied in, uh, in Ethiopia and to which he was to devote most of his career as an anthropologist. That is spiritual possession against material possession. Now it seems to me that in this context, uh, Lewis's dread of uh, impotency, his alleged impotence, sorry, 
uh, amounts to an inability or a refusal to endorse the basis upon which the very presence of the expedition is justified. And in his choice of fiction and in his choice of Conrad, it seems to me that it expresses, this testifies to his understanding of the links between ethics and aesthetics. very much for uh, your invitation to speak today and <clears throat> I have just completed a 600 page PhD mostly on this subject so if you see me at any point starting to digress into a half page long footnote please intervene and stop me immediately. <clears throat> so the key thing to note about the French Roman d'Aventure adventure novel to which my title refers is that at the turn of the 20th century, it did not exist. At least, not yet. In the wake of the fall of the realist naturalist movement, French letters were experiencing a crise du roman, a crisis of the novel. And in seeking a way out of this impasse, various critics called for a new novel. The novel that was to come, Le Roman à venir, the novel of tomorrow, that was to be a novel of adventure. Thus, they invoked the very temporality of adventure, the ad venire, in the novel whose imminent arrival they predicted. Their examples came from abroad, particularly from England, where they saw in writers such as Robert Louis Stevenson a way forward beyond the stale oppositions that had dominated literary discourse at the end of the 19th century, between the novel of incident and the novel of character, uh, the roman romanesque and the roman d'analyse. This new novel would take the narrative drive of the literature of imagination, too long left in the hands of what Henri Guéon called pornographers and churners out of serials <laughs> during the long dominance of realism, and combine it with the insights of the psychological novelists to create a new, highly literary roman d'aventure. So what I'd like to argue in this paper is that it was this atmosphere of crisis and these calls for a way out of the dead ends in which French, the French novel found itself, embodied in an artistic novel of psychological as well as physical adventure which conditioned the early reception of Joseph Conrad in France. His novels of troubled and troubling adventure appeared to arrive as if in answer to these calls. His was the novel that was to come. So the literary scene in France in the 1890s was dominated by symbolism. Writers pursuing the word, the image, and complex sets of personal metaphors and recondite bejeweled poetry. The novel was never a symbolist form, and the novel was perceived to be moribund. The pseudo-scientific researches of the naturaliste novel and the roman psychologique to be exhausted. The erudite critic and writer Marcel Schwab, responding to the Prise du Roman in 1891, took this idea of crisis and made it central to his prediction for the future direction of the novel. If the novel survives, he said, it would be a novel of crisis, a novel of adventure. Alors le roman sera sans doute un roman d'aventure, dans le sens le plus large du mot. Le roman des crises du monde intérieur et du monde extérieur. Adventure occurred at the moment of crisis, and this crisis could be outward and physical, or inward and psychological or spiritual. 
Adventure in the broadest sense of the word was the key to the novel that was to come. Influenced by these readings of Stevenson, Schwab predicted that this novel would go beyond the dichotomy of realism and romance and perform a synthesis. It was to be a novel of realism irréel. Camille Beauclair joined in an 1898 article entitled Le Roman de Demain, in which he argues that the adventure novel, reappropriated by intellectuals, is the way forward for fiction in France, announcing its arrival like a voice crying in the wilderness. Nous n'avons plus qu'une issue, l'aventure, qui nous donne le monde pour décor. Au fond, il n'a manqué à Jules Verne qu'un style et de la profondeur. Le sens d'une conclusion morale devant les spectacles qu'il décrivit pour être un très grand financier. Sorry. D'accord. And then he describes the hero of this new adventure novel. Qu'il soit conquérant du monde extrême oriental, capitaine, pirate, dictateur d'anarchie ou prêtre ou martyr, ou chef des incultes, Dieu nouveau, mais qu'il élève une voix plus hautaine que nos petites voix, qu'il sache parler en maître à la foule qui attend, le héros du roman futur. So this description of the hero of the adventure novel of tomorrow puts us in mind of Conrad's conquerors of the Far East, such as Lord Jim or Karain, his sea captains, even his pirates, occasionally. But I think particularly of Kurtz, chief of savages and new god, who was even then in gestation. But this shows the extent to which Conrad was to both embody and subvert these ideas of heroism. Importantly also, it shows us the three fit features that future critics would call for in this new novel of adventure, and which Conrad was seen to succeed in capturing in his work. The novel must have spectacle, exotic settings and narrative drive, also depth and moral implicativeness, and finally, the novel was to be that of an artist, have style, that eminent, eminently French quality that the critics found so abundantly in Conrad. Now, the critic who gave the earliest and most sustained attention to Conrad's work in its initial reception in France was Henri Durand d'Avray, a literary passeur who acted as a conduit between French and English letters from the 1890s up to the 1920s, covering Conrad's entire career. He was quick to recognize Conrad as one of us, did not. In his first article on him, identifying Conrad's style as coming directly from the lessons of the French master Flaubert. Conrad's intimate knowledge of Flaubert is what gives him access to this quality, so rare apparently in English books, and makes him an honorary Frenchman. In his review of The Nigger of the Narcissus, Conrad is said to employ the simplest of means to accomplish the most intensive effects, making the reader live through the grand, tragic, mortal hours of the Tempest, moments of crisis such as these that are at the heart of the novel of adventure in Schwab's sense. Debray situated Conrad in, in a new wave of imaginative literature that was crossing the channel from England at the beginning of the 20th century, placing him with Kipling and Wells as embodying all that was lacking in the French novel at the time. André Gide had identified Kipling and Wells as embodying this idea of adventure, as he and his group were beginning to theorize it at the time, providing a new way of not only seeing but living life. Quelque chose d'affirmatif, de forcené, something one might say passionate and wild. And Davray, in his series of articles on Conrad, comes back again and again to this triumvirate, Kipling, Wells, and Conrad. They seem to embody the diametrically opposite pole to the dominant French novel of manners, drawing rather on the tradition of imaginative literature, of adventure. In a 1901 article, he places them in order of his preference, uh, and, in, and in order of their achieving the goals, incidentally, set out by Mauclair. Kipling has mastered spectacle in his exotic jungle book, for example. Wells has gone further because he also has um, underneath his spectacle a philosophical idea. He captures the scope of the idea. But it is only Conrad who manages all three, who has spectacle, who has the ideas, and who also has the formal perfection, the style. Joseph Conrad, Don Lord Jim, Tales of Unrest, The Nigger of the Narcissus, nous a, sous une forme exquise, révélé un monde inconnu et des existences puissamment et profondément dramatiques en dehors de nos conventions civilisées européennes. Mauclair's urgent wish for heroes of romance that bestride the Far Eastern world, that rise in the fortune of isles of fantasy, is recalled by Davray's description of the powerful and profound drama of Conrad's characters' lives. Now, Davray um, was set up to be Conrad's primary agent and translator in France in the 1900s. 
And this would have put Conrad even more clearly in this wave of the new adventure novel coming from Britain, as Dabray had also translated and published with the Mercure de France, um, Kipling and, and, and Wells, sorry, Kipling and Wells. Um, but, however, it did not really happen. Um, Dabray was only to provide two translations of Conrad in the years before the First World War. Uh, things went very slowly. Relatively few translations came out. Um, the Nigger of the Narcissus in 1909 uh, and the, the Secret Agent in 1912 were the only two novels. Apart from that, uh, there were yeah, an outpost of progress in 1903 in Marguerite Korolewska's version, Dabre's Carain in the Mercury de France in 1906, and Joseph de Smet's Typhoon in Croquet in 1911. There was also a translation and staging of Tomorrow in 1909 at the Théâtre des Arts, and that was published, a full version of the short story was published by the same translator. Um, apart from Dabry, critics had not paid that much attention to Conrad. In 1903, there was one major article by Kazimir Zwolezuski. Uh, he made the link with Kipling as well, but he also presented Conrad as a phenomenon. First of all, for his double career as a sailor and writer, and second of all, for his writing in a language that was not his original language. Um, but he also presented Conrad as something very far away from any association with a popular novel of adventure. He presented him as a difficult elite author for the elites, speaking to an elite audience of a literary review. And indeed, we can see this dichotomy in his presentation in the serious monthlies, the literary reviews, we see him presented as an elite author, a difficult author, uh, uh, not to say impenetrable, but when you see reviews of his books in the daily newspapers, very often they introduce him as a conteur, as a storyteller, somebody who has the power of adventurous narrative at his fingertips. And of course, in both, his adventurous life was concentrated on, showing that he had a certain authority to speak of dangerous events in exotic locations. Now, around 1910, he was slowly starting to penetrate into the French literary consciousness, and it was around this time that André Gide encountered him and his group who would go on to set up the Nouvelle Revue Française. Uh, what, what was happening at this point was that the Nouvelle Revue Française had become uh, part of a, a, a review that was very much <coughs> elevated itself to the centre of the French literary scene. And in tandem with their reading of Conrad, they were developing a theory of the Roman d'Aventure, which had begun around 1900, but can be traced further back to Schwab and Mauclair's articles. And they were elaborating this theory in a series of articles as they were reading Conrad. Uh, part of what they're talking about is, again, the idea of transcending the dichotomy between the novel of character and the novel of incident. They say that English authors manage to do this, that this is something English authors are good at. Psychological, psychological depth with what Jacques Copeau calls that simple and healthy passion, the essence of the novelistic art, the passion for telling a story. Now, this theory, theorizing, I should say, culminated in Jacques Rivière's 1913 essay, Le Roman d'Aventure, which was a, a lyrical rallying cry, a call to arms to sweep away the cobwebs of the, the 19th century, particularly of symbolism. And the Roman d'Aventure that he describes, which would be the source of more violent and joyful pleasures, has many features which are strikingly Conradian. It's even, not just features, but dimensions. Dabre always insisted on the fact that Conrad's novels were incredibly long compared to French novels. And he says that the Roman d'Aventure is long full of extrusions and, ex, um, and outgrowths, ramifying. He says, it's, he says, I quote, these interminable narratives interrupt the principal story, confessions, pages from diaries, doctrines professed by one of the characters, which seems a rather perfect description of the interleaving narratives of Lord Jim say. Or we can think of Conrad expressed frequently in his letters to Dabre his impression of the monstrosity of Lord Jim or of Nostromo as it appeared to grow beneath his hands. Um, he talks about impressions communicated directly in dialogue, in meetings, in visits, 
in goings up and down stairs, in incidents on footpaths, in chance encounters on street corners, recalling, I think, the urban adventure of Conrad's The Secret Agent, which had just come out in French at that point. So there, these are novels that bring into being a new reality, the creatable world, a novel of the crises of the interior and exterior worlds, and so uh, possibly a novel of psychological adventure. But also, and perhaps most significantly, it is to be a novel of formal adventure. L'aventure, c'est la forme de l'œuvre plutôt que sa matière. And this key observation of Rivière's was echoed in exactly what was coming to the fore in the reception of Conrad at this point, as people start to talk about his technical innovations, his formal adventurousness. Indeed, they, they'd often commented on the psychological depth, but now they're going to the actual formal questions. And the first writer to pay much attention to that is Joseph de Smet, who also translated Typhoon. He was the first translator of that. And he actually, while he has some very good things to say about Conrad's ways of seeing, ways of perceiving and writing and experiencing, he actually upbraids Conrad for what he calls his abuse of disrupted chronological order. He kind of raps on the table, that's no good. Conrad, this use of anachrony is also linked to um, this is in 1912, by the way, to, with the complexity of his embedding of narratives, one, with, one within the other. And De Smet, this, this, this disturbs his sense of literary propriety. He says, J'ai noté dans l'origine ce livre du reste absolument merveilleux, l'exemple curieux d'une transposition de ce genre au cinquième degré. À certains moments, l'auteur dit, que le, le capitaine Marlow raconte qu'un certain Ekstrom lui a écrit, qu'un capitaine de navire lui a relaté, que Lord Jim lui a dit, etc. Now, this narrative experimentation, of course, um, dispensing with omniscient authorial voices for a chain of reported narratives, breaking out of this chronological sequence of plot, um, these are some of the primary ways in which we can identify Conrad as one of the first modernist writers. And in the Nouvelle Revue Française, we have Valérie Larbeau, himself a noted French modernist. Um, he's the one who introduced Gide to Conrad, by the way. Um, he gives a much more knowing assessment of this indirect narration. And he talks about the, the modern novel having a conscience, a critical and moral faculty operating somewhere. In the novels of Conrad, this conscience is the supposed narrator. So he attributes to the novel itself what other less sophisticated critics would attribute to the writer. We notice the difference between his supposed narrator and dismets the author says that. Um, so he does say, however, that there's a big difference between England and France. In England, there is no division, he says, between the discrete elite and the general reader. He says that, in fact, uh, English novelists have to, the, the, the sine qua non of the English novel is plot. They can't dispense with plot, unlike French novelists. And he, he calls it the rusty old carcass of plot. He says, what does plot matter to us? It's not important. But Conrad sticks to it because he is an English writer. And so his novels are adventurous both in their outward movement and in their inward movement and in their formal movement. So, we discussed Gide's um, translation of Typhoon in 1918, which was the turning point, really. This is where Conrad's career really took off, uh, after the war. And Typhoon was to remain very influential in the perception of Conrad in France, um, associated as it was with Gide's literary uh, eminence. And indeed, Emily Whitman, in an article that has appeared on Conrad first, um, are, yeah, and which, where she talks a lot about La Fée Fantôme as well. Yeah. Um, she argues that it was fundamental to the appeal of Conrad in France that he evoked a nostalgia for an earlier time in which masculine heroism was possible, before the First World War particularly. Now, I would argue that together with this nostalgia, which is certainly present, there's a deep ambivalence about the very idea of heroism and a problematization of the idea of adventure that particularly resonated with French readers in the wake of the Great War. Juliette Droz, in an article from 1918, notes that Conrad's heroes seem to have been plucked out of the background. We know them previously only as silhouettes, and now they're placed in the foreground. And that he, 
he questions the imperialist notion of the preeminence of, I quote, the just man, the strong man, the occidental conqueror, lording it over the poor wretches of natives in a way that leaves the reader troubled and disconcerted. Danbury picked up the same point, talking about the fact that Conrad's heroes had nothing really exceptional about them, that neither in moral virtue nor physical capabilities. Um, Edmund Jaloux, in an article published in the Nouvelle Revue Française, Hommage to Conrad, uh, just after his death, returns to the same theme. He calls his article, Joseph Conrad in le roman d'aventure anglais. How am I doing time? Do I need to finish up that very quickly? Four minutes. All right, okay. That will be good. Um, and he attempts to articulate what it was that made Conrad so different to previous writers of adventure. It's in his subversion of the conventional idea of the adventure hero that Conrad is at once so different and so much more of an artist than previous purveyors of adventure. The heroes of Joseph Conrad, he says, are not made for adventures. They're swept into adventure against their will. Just ici, nous regardions agir les, les, les héros du roman d'aventure comme s'ils appartenaient à une espèce autre que nous. Nous les admirions sans beaucoup croire à la résistance. Mais avec Conrad, nous comprenons soudain que nous pourrions demain être embarqués dans des péripéties aussi extraordinaires que celles qui remplissent la folie arrière ou la ligne d'eau. Psychologically, Jalou argues, Conrad's heroes are never completely determined. They are forever, unlike typical adventure novel heroes, they are forever moving and in a state of perpetual becoming. And in fact, in this psychological relativism, Jalou argues that Conrad actually prefigures Proust. Uh, in fact, and he links up with Riviere's Roman d'Aventure here, he says that if Conrad had written in French, as some, some critics in France like to claim he could have, although Conrad completely disagreed, um, if he had written in French, he would have given them what they had always lacked, which is the great novel of psychological adventure. Conrad was the only adventure novelist who was a true psychologist, he says. But he doesn't see the possibility of this ever happening because for him, adventure is particularly English and cannot exist in the same way in France because the adventure novel comprises, above all, the examination of human solitude. And the French novel has no other object of study than society. So despite there being a renaissance of interest in the Roman d'Aventure in the 1920s, arguably Conrad is actually the best answer to all these calls for the novel of the future, the roman avenir. There were, and in the translations of his work, in the Edition de la Nouvelle Revue Française, which picked up and throughout the 1920s, almost all of his work was published. And I could list them, but I think I'll, you can ask me about them later. Um, <clears throat> as Rivière had predicted, this roman d'aventure psychologique from abroad had been brought into France and, in his words, infused into the French bloodstream. And I think we can see that in the 1930s with Léris, for example, that Conrad has been infused into the literary bloodstream. And, of course, as you showed us, today he is really omnipresent. He's inescapable um, in the last 20 years, I would say. Uh, so, as we know, Conrad himself was skeptical of the very idea of adventure. In Well Done, he, he says, Adventure by itself is but a phantom, a dubious shape without a heart. <clears throat> Davray quotes telling words from him around the same period. Just after the war, he says, speaking of modern methods of destruction, Conrad said to me, Romance died with the knight's errand. There is no panache anymore. Adventure must be sought elsewhere, but everywhere that man finds it, he kills it. This is the paradox of the heart of Conrad's writing of adventure. It both belongs to a vanished past, object of now painful nostalgia, and is forever in the future, slipping away over the horizon in that ever undiscovered country over the hill, never quite attainable. His novels managed to do the amazing jewel feat of providing both the essence of adventure to the French reading public, and also a meditation on its very impossibility. The French conception of the Roman d'Aventure, as it developed in the years around the turn of the 20th century, was of a novel that would transcend the oppositions between the novel of analysis and character on the one hand and the novel of imagination and incident on the other. Conrad was seen to achieve this synthesis of opposites. He was described as a réaliste imaginative, 
and a psychologue romanesque. His novel was the one that Schwab and Mauclair had predicted and had called for, the novel of the crises of the interior and exterior worlds, the novel in which a whole world was created, in which dramatic incident intersects with vivid living character, in which existential and elemental forces provide the conflict between characters, within them, and with the world around them. It was not only a novel of adventure in the narrative sense, but also in the philosophical and moral senses, and in its formal experimentation, also it embodied adventure. Conrad's flawed human heroes, confronted with the disillusion of seeing their beliefs in romance shattered, questioned the very possibility of adventure, thus providing the philosophical depth necessary to epitomize this French experiment in thought in the Roman literature.